if you all join me in a prayer thanksgiving gracious loving giving and eternal heavenly father we bless you for the many ways you made your presence felt in each of our lives and indeed those servants around the world just as you made your promise to abraham and to isaac and jacob the promise of land the promise of seed the promise of hope the promise of opportunity the promise of challenge and the promise of reunion and celebration you make each of those promises to, uh, to each of us today we pray for each family represented here we pray for the members of our class who are sick or in distress or in difficult situations we pray for your presence uh, in each of those situations and your comfort in each of those situations pray that you'll continue to be with us as we uh, study and as we uh, work to enhance the depth and the breadth of our faith pray that you'll be with our teacher as she delivers your message to us forgive us our many sins that's in jesus name i mean so van leer if we can give you the pulpit without the podium Red, if you'll hold your questions till the end, and you'll be prepared. Don't ask any questions. That we're going to talk about the biggest mystery in the Old Testament today. Nobody has any answers to it. You make it up. You kind of come to your own conclusions. I've got to figure out how this thing works. For for Gus, you all remember when Russell was here. Russell would, so often would talk about that mystery, mystery of life, and how important that aspect of faith is. He 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 was relentless. In each of us. Oh, it's all a mystery. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. Speaking of Russell, yeah, sir, one 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 yes. uh, Russell and Carmen were here in town. Were they? What? Uh, two days ago, three days ago. Please bring us up today. And we had lunch with them over at uh, Milk Bread. Um, Carmen had an appointment down in Charlotte for uh, treatment, and then they came here meet us for lunch, and then they went up to Mooresville for where Russell had a dental appointment. <laughs> They're doing very well. They're aging like the rest of us, <laughs> moving rather slowly, but um, Russell's uh, wit is as sharp as ever. Although I did hear some of the stories I'd heard many times. <laughs> and, and Carmen is very active at the home where they live. They were in, at a place called Scotia village in Lorenberg, which is a Presbyterian supported um, um, care facility, much, much like the Pines. Um, Carmen is very active in that organ and organized a green group at, at the home where they live now. And she's conducting field trips and encouraging gardening among the members as much as she can. So they're, they're still active and engaged and able to drive from Lorenberg to Charlotte and back. So. It was good to see them. Now, one mystery Russell left with us was the disposition of his father's coin collection. Has that been resolved? Yeah, we didn't <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Russell had this enigma. His father had this massive coin collection, and it would in Russell's brother's safe deposit box for safekeeping <laughs> from Russell. <laughs> So when you see him, we always wonder. Scotia Village was formed out of the Larnberg Christian Church, just like this was formed out of this church. Oh, well, I hope I don't blow you out. But John says I have to have this. Um, this morning, our lesson comes... Uh, it, well, the, it's the 49th chapter of Isaiah, which of course is second Isaiah. We're dealing with concept of the servant. And I will start by reading this. Listen to me, coastlands. Pay attention, peoples far away. Lord called me before my birth, called my name when I was in my mother's womb. He made my mouth like a sharp sword and hid me in the shadow of God's hand. He made me a sharpened arrow and concealed me in God's quiver, saying to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I show my glory. Throughout Second Isaiah, there is this reference to the servant. At times, it sounds um, as though the servant is an individual. 
At times it sounds as though the servant is Israel. At times people have even interpreted the servant as being Cyrus the Great, who is going to do this, you know, this free the, free the people. He's, but, and then, as we'll see in a minute, um, Christians have a whole other interpretation of the servant. But if you look at, um, in four chapters particularly, the 42nd chapter, the servant has said, he will bring forth justice to the nations. In the 49th chapter, Yahweh call me from the tomb. You are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. In the 50th chapter, morning by morning, he wakens my ear. And in the 50, uh, 52nd, let me read that because that's starting in the 52nd chapter. Look, my servant will succeed. He will be exalted and lifted very high. Just as many were appalled by you, he too appeared disfigured, inhuman, his appearance unlike that of mortals. But he will astonish many nations. Kings will be silenced because of him, because they will see what they haven't seen before, what they haven't heard before, they will ponder. Who can believe what we have heard, and for whose sake has the Lord's arm been revealed? He grew up like a young plant before us, like a root from dry ground. He possessed no splendid form for us to see, no desirable appearance. He was despised and avoided by others, a man who suffered, who knew sickness well. Like someone from whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we didn't think about him. The suffering servant. Now, if you'll remember, um, in, in the book of Acts, uh, Peter comes upon um, a, a eunuch from Ethiopia, a servant of the king of Ethiopia, and he's reading uh, Isaiah, the eunuch, and he says, explain this to me. What is this? And Peter uses this suffering service servant to describe the ministry of Christ to this eunuch. So that mid Christians, and after after sight, <laughs> um, Christians have seen this as as a reference to the coming Messiah. He will be despised and rejected of men. He will be. He will suffer. He will bear our sins. He will bear our illnesses, and he will die for us. Actually, Isaiah at this time, whoever the, uh, the author of Isaiah, Second Isaiah was, didn't, at this time there was not really a concept in, in, Israelite, in Israel, Israelite thinking of resurrection, of a physical resurrection. So it's, 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 it's Christians reading into this I mean, with hindsight, but it is very applicable because Isaiah is talking about this idea of God redeeming man through suffering. And the idea that suffering is redemptive, Martin Luther King would talk about that, that concept of the, the redemptiveness of suffering. And Isaiah is, is filled with this, this idea that God is going to redeem us, although, and although we may suffer, we will be redeemed in the end. He talks a great deal, but he is, <clears throat> excuse me. So Isaiah is, is uh, we talked last week about the fact that Isaiah is looking down the road. He is seeing liberation. They are in Babylon. They are exiled from home. And yet Isaiah is, is believing and talking about an imminent deliverance because he is aware that Cyrus the Great is, is on the move. And indeed, that's what's going to happen. I mean, we know that, Cyrus, that Babylon will fall. But, and so Isaiah is talking about a, re, a resurrection of, of Israel, and that Israel will glorify God through a new birth and a new life. Now, in reality, Israel would never, ever became, again, what it had been be prior to uh, the fall, but prior to the fall of the northern kingdom, the fall of the southern kingdom. Politically, it would never amount to much, again. It was always going to be a kind of a backwater province of whatever the dominant empire of the day was. 
But look what happened to the religion. Because in Babylon comes not only the idea that God is, is everywhere, that remarkable insight, but also in Babylon comes the idea that God is not just our God. He's the God of the whole universe. Other people may not recognize him, but we do. And we will live our lives in reflection. Our lives as Israelites, as Jews, will be lived in reflection of the, the, mighty, the mightiness and the glory of our God. That's a whole new idea. And so here's the servant. At times it sounds as though the servant is an individual. At times it sounds as though the servant is all of Israel. Um, rather than being a, one, one scholar says, rather than have being a biological description of one person in one place and time, the servant is the description of the human being whom all who love God are challenged to become. Think about that. As you read these passages, as you read, um, come around, I spoon around here. But here is my servant, the one I uphold, my chosen who brings me delight. I've put my spirit upon him, he will bring justice to the nations. He won't cry out or shout aloud or make his voice heard in public. He won't break a bruised reed, he won't extinguish a faint wick. He will surely bring justice. He won't be extinguished or broken until he has established justice in the land. The coastlands await his teachings. Is that the servant? Is, is that what we are called to be? The servant and through us, God does his work on this earth? Think about that. Do we not live our lives, hopefully, in reflection of the mighty, of the grace of God? One of the, um, of course, I'm, I'm speaking as a Christian. I'm speaking in hindsight, looking back, but uh, one of the you know it, it, one of the great teachings of Paul is that we are we are justified through faith, and we have salvation not because we buy it or earn it, but we are saved by the grace of God, and therefore we live our lives in reflection of that grace. Not it, we we do right. You do good things not because not in order to build up bounty points in heaven. We build, we live our, we do good things not to be saved, but because we are saved, and our lives are a reflection of the grace of that salvation. And to some extent, that's what that's what Isaiah is talking about here. We are called to be a light to the nations. And our lives, our life as a nation, and our lives as individual in that nation, are, are to be should be a reflection of that call and of that power that God sends to us. For the Son of Man, another scholar says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Isaiah defines and re says that Israel is, excuse me, is redeemed through the suffering of a servant, both as a corporate entity and individually. The portrait of the servant is complex, defying any easy salvation of the problem, solution of the problem by saying that the servant is either individual or collective. The servant represents both the corporate and the personal. So finally, I wrote um, last night when I was thinking about this, the servant is the true Israelite, a composite of the experience of Israel's devout men and women who suffer affliction with an unshakable faith in God. So uh, he, Isaiah talks frequently about um, Abraham particularly, but whom he sees Abraham both as individual and corporate, the founder of a nation. And Abraham's actions and his unshakable faith in God is an example to the people. This is how we are to live. The servant represents Israel. The servant is us as well. The 
the servant represents Israel, but the servant is us as well. We are servants, and we should live our lives as such. God's purpose for Israel, says one scholar, has put God's purpose for Israel has put on skin and flesh. The purpose is to live as a servant of God. Any of you have any reactions to that? Yeah, I do. I've always had uh, a little quarrel with the church when it asks for volunteers to do something. I've always thought it would be far more biblical, if not accurate, to say we need some servants. Need some servants. Yeah. To do this and yeah. to do that. Step up. <laughs> a volunteer, by definition, is someone who has some free time. I don't know many folks who have free time. That's an interesting. So, yeah. No. A servant is really sacrificing. Sacrificing what they have, and that's basically what turns people off from being part of the community of faith is that I'm not willing to give up what I have, be it time or money or whatever. But I've always thought that volunteer is the inappropriate word to use in the body of Christ. There are no volunteers in the kingdom of God. No. Hmm. No. No, it, you are called, it is, a, it is a way of reflecting the kingdom. It is a way of reflecting the glory of God. And a volunteer, when they're told to jump, they don't ask how high, but a servant does. Yeah, that's right. And it's also a way, Isaiah is saying, and I think the same thing for the, for the church in, in the present world, the way the church behaves, the way Israel behaves, the way the church behaves is the way God's message is, tra is, is sent to the nations. He says, I will appoint you as a light to the nations so that my salvation shall reach to the ends of the earth. You are to be an example. People will follow you. Incidentally, that's really new thought in, in Israelite thinking. My, my salvation will approach to the ends of the earth. The idea that God is universal rather than just the God of this little group of people. So the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, his Holy One, says to one despised, rejected by nations, to the slave of rulers, kings will see and stand up, commanders will bow down on account of the Lord who is faithful, Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. The Lord said at the right time, I answered you on the day of salvation, I helped you, I have guarded you. Now he is saying, you respond to that. I answered you, I guarded you, I have helped you, now you respond to that in your life. That's a pretty significant call. So you have an obligation. Maybe. And it is an obligation, it is a duty. Mutual yeah. obligation, seemingly. Yes. Uh, to Gus's boy, sir. To serve, and it, it and it, it's not a it's not something you do just out of the goodness. You do it because it is a reflection of all that God has done for you. And it's also out of obedience to the master. Exactly. Yes, it is. It is. It is an obligation. It is one that we should be happy to take up. Anything else? Anything? This is hard stuff, and you know, scholars have argued about the servant for you know two thousand years. So who am I to stand up here and be definitive about it? But it's I'm just sitting here pondering how this relates to modern day Judaism. Uh, you have uh, practicing and observant Jews. You have many, maybe maybe many more who don't, who are non-religious. Yeah, and. I, I wonder how that servanthood goes forward to today. And I'm conscious of the fact that uh, the servant is going to be abused, you know, despised. Rejected of men. And the Jewish people have suffered this kind of uh, plague uh, by, by humanity. Even within living memory. It's hard to understand. Of course, Hitler used them as a scapegoat, you know, to blame everything on <clears throat> on them. Uh, but why? 
why in the world, uh, across the world, the Jews are despised like they are, represented by Shylock, you know? <laughs> Uh, well, even today, it's um, in our even today in, in 2022, anti-Semitism is on the rise in this country. And if you go by the temple on South Street when they're having a service, there's a police car sitting out in front of the service, which is just distressing to me. But I think, in partial answer to your question, the fact that they still exist that. It, in, sti in spite of the burden and the dangers of being a Jew, these people still identify. They haven't attempted to hide in greater society. They, they identify as, as, a, as a people of God. Right? That's a servant. <clears throat> yes. well, following up a little bit on... My, my thoughts were on, along the same lines as Bill's. At, at the time, this, this whole notion of the message of this suffering servant being not just for the Jews, but for the whole world, to the coastlines. That's pretty revolutionary. Yeah, to, to what extent did the Jewish faith as it evolved and is today see that as a, a commission of theirs? I, I'm not sure that they do. I think they see, I think, I'm not an expert on Judaism, but I think they, they see, um, as you know, they don't proselyte. Right. They don't. Um, and we don't very much either. Well, we're supposed to. <laughs> but they don't. Um, what a, a rabbi once said to me was, um, he said, I said, what would happen if somebody approached you who was not Jewish and wanted to be a Jew, wanted to become a Jew? She, he said, we would push you away with one hand and gather you in with the other. We would make it hard for you, but we would accept you. If you, if you stayed the course, we would accept you. That's what he was saying. They don't proselytize. They don't proselytize, but they also don't reject. Um, but I think that they see they see themselves as as a people apart and a people called, and I think they still see this idea. I think somewhere in Judaism there's still an idea that we are we are a light to the nations. And yet, and yet, I think a case can be made in Isaiah 40, uh, verse nine, where it says, "Get you unto a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings." Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up and do not fear. I think that you could argue that that is a call to evangelism. And I Shout, messenger Jerusalem. That, yes, here is the Lord your God coming with strength, with a triumphant arm, bringing his reward with him and his payment before him. Like a shepherd, God will tend the flock. He will gather lambs in his arms and lift them into his lap. He will gently guide the nurse and use. And that's a slightly different picture. That's that's a loving God. But that's directed. But that's yes, you are to be a message, a, a light to the people. Yeah, light to the nations. I was also interested. I, the the verse before that is the grass dries up, the flower withers, but our God's word will exist forever. If you go by the Baptist Church on Davidson Concord Road, that's on their sign right now. That's the message that they have on there. <laughs> Grass dries up, the flower withers, but the Lord's word will exist forever. So, do you feel called? Do you feel? Um, do you feel ready to be a servant? I'd rather be a volunteer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Whether you're ready or not, you're called. <laughs> you are expected. So it just takes one comment to initiate a paradigm shift. But from this day forward, Gus. <laughs> we're servants. Right. Sir, no, no more volunteering. We're, we're serving. <laughs> I'm used to being a servant. I have two cats. <laughs> yeah. And yes, exactly. I'm, I'm, I live to serve myself. So. Anything else about this? What do you think? It is, it is a heavy, it is a charge. The servant is Israel. 
The servant is Jesus. The servant is us. Okay. Okay. It's time for friends. Yeah, well, we just started it. I can... <laughs> um, in this Christian church that we're supposed to be in, in many other churches, we is gloom and doom. We emphasize the pain and the stream. Well, so I'm supposed to be a servant. I drop off the suffering part right away. We were talking about this last night. Nobody says you can't be a joyful servant. I am. <laughs> be optimistic about this. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you know it. You're not suffering. We do good works. Well, because we may, not because we must, because we may. I'm just quoting Paul. That's uh, uh, it's me. And so when I talk to a rabbi or somebody else, I've been treated beautifully by Jews. What the doc's in concern? Mm -hmm. Well, Fred, you're different. You're well in there. Different because you're you're accepting? You ask questions and you're pleasant to be around. You don't have a whole bucket of of uh, problems to lay out there. Oh, feel sorry for Fred because of this or that. So what? If I can't serve what I've done a little bit, if I have a little bit of service, it's just a wonderful euphoric feeling. But I drop the suffering. I know theologically I'm in deep trouble here, <laughs> but it's the way. It works. I will stop right now because David's getting ready. But it's a curiosity to me. Why can't we be optimistic? The suffering servant motif, though, has been redeemed. So when we talk about the suffering servant, that is. That's kind of post-resurrection suffering servant motif. We are servants in the household of God, and I think the paradigm of the servant understanding now, and the word is not servant, of course, it's slave, <laughs> that... Make it worse. The paradigm is what we find in Luke 15 in, in the prodigal son, mm -hmm. that when the son leaves which is basically a slave who is escaping and taking part of the master's possessions with him, what happens to the suffering servant or to the, to the slave who has run away? That slave is restored. And that's what irritates the older slave, the older brother. But the, but the slave, through the lens of the resurrection, is not someone who is, who is a doormat. It is someone who, who is serving joyfully in the house of the Lord. Because the servant knows how well he or she is being treated and taken care of by the master. Like a shepherd, God will tend the flock. He will gather lambs in his arms and lift them into his lap. Yeah. Yeah. And that was bad exegesis of theology in, in the 19th century when from the pulpits of many a church, Presbyterian, there was sermons being foisted upon congregations that was basically uh, justifying the institution. Slavery, yeah, yeah. It's bad theology. Oh, horrible. I've been <coughs> using the, uh, <coughs> it's called these days, 
<coughs> daily devotion. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and recently, the, the, the messages have centered on uh, love and being kind. And it strikes me, <coughs> and I'm speaking out of my own personal experience, that one of the most difficult challenges of servanthood is kindness. <laughs> kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ has forgiven you. And I, I, I observe it, I'm sure I observe it in my life, but I observe it in the life of the church. It's just a lack of kindness, <clears throat> uh, denominational wise, uh, in politics. In our community life, and it seems like to me that this is one of the greatest challenges of, of servanthood. Is it's a simple, you call it love, and, and the issue of love is kindness. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> love thy neighbor as thyself. I saw some tweet that Donald Trump made. Mm -hmm. He was talking about. Someone, and then parenthetically he said, he sucks. <laughs> Bill Barr. He also said um, that if Mike Pence, if the mob hung Mike Pence, he would deserve it. Yeah. <clears throat> there we are. This comes in different flavors. Yeah. I'm talking true. Who wins? We're very competitive in America. Who wins? Who has the biggest car? Who has the biggest house? Etc. You know, I don't think I won anything, but I know a lot of pleasant people, nice people, and I like being with them. And speaking of the past president, I feel sorry for him. I wish I could puncture his gas bag, but. I can't do it. So I, I, I'm not supposed to ever talk about politics. It's all right, Fred. <laughs> Kindness. <coughs> Why can't we extend the open hand? Why can't we? I, the fighting Illini, the fighting. Syracusans, the fighting Irish, tired of that. I want this. I want to listen a little bit. That's why I come here so I can learn something. He also set me straight. If he doesn't, David will. <laughs> so it's not well. That's why I'm here. If Jesus is our model, Jesus, if Jesus is our model, he never, you know, what was the last thing? Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, forgive them. Let's bow our heads and say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we strive to live our lives as your servants. We know we often fail. But we do have the example of your Son, our Savior, before us. We do have the comfort of knowing that we live in your love and in your glory and in your grace. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us to be worthy of all that you have done for us. Help us to show that we are indeed your children and your servants. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.